So I'm giving this talk. Uh, Michael Kalen asked me to, and I figured it'd be a good chance to get it on tape anyway. So, what? Oh, sorry, wrong mic. I guess you give it me loose. <laughs> so, why am I giving a talk on ADHD? Again, uh, because ADHD is actually fairly common. There are about five to six percent of the people in the United States who have it. And on top of that, there are a lot of other mental disorders that people don't talk about, ADHD being one of them. We don't talk about mental disorders pretty much at all in this country. It's very stigmatized. It's very hush-hush. We don't talk about it openly. We don't talk about it with friends. We barely talk about it with family. You go to your therapist, which is behind closed doors, and discuss that for an hour, and then leave back into the real world and pack everything carefully back in a box. So I want to give some t a talk on ADHD and potentially some other uh, disorders as well, mental disorders as well, to try and kind of bust this open, start talking about these things, start getting it out there, get knowledge out there. Why me? Well, I'm lucky enough or unlucky enough, depending on the way you look at it, uh, to have won the genetic lottery. I have ADHD, which if you've known me for more than five minutes is probably not shocking. I also have general ang generalized anxiety disorder, which is fairly common as a concurrent disorder. So I've been through therapy, I'm on medicine, um, and I've done a lot of research because that's kind of the person I am about my disorder and about the brain, which is part of the reason I give a bunch of talks about the brain. So first off, you've probably got some conclusions about what ADHD is. So I'm gonna tell you what it isn't and it isn't most of the things that you've probably seen. It's not a hyperactive kid on a sugar high, which doesn't exist either, just for reference. It's not carelessness or lack of caring or boredom. And it's really not spastic squirrel chasing in all directions either. So what is it? Well. It's a psychiatric disorder of the executive functions, which I'm sure is very helpful to most of you. Specifically, it is a dysfunction of your attentional control and your inhibitory control. In your brain, you have a frontal cortex, which is where most of our being human part lives. Your attentional control and inhibitory control live up there. ADHD is essentially a misfiring of those two areas which inhibits your ability to focus, inhibits your ability to um, control your inhibitions, and inhibits your ability to not move in some cases. About six to seven percent of the United States children have ADHD. That's a very conservative estimate. About two to five percent of adults have ADHD. That's also a very conservative estimate. You may notice the difference between those two numbers. It isn't that it's growing. A lot of children actually do grow out of ADHD about puberty. Who knows why? It's diagnosed about two and a half times more in boys than girls. This doesn't mean that boys get it more than girls. It just means it's diagnosed more. There's a couple reasonings behind that. One is that boys traditionally present more active, more hyperactive than girls. Girls are often taught that they should be quiet. They should be conservative. They should hold things inside. And it could just be that the disease actually represents, presents differently in boys versus girls. We're not sure yet, which is really kind of sad. So what does it do to you? Well, there's three major types. There's inattentive ADHD, and there's impulsiveness and hyperactive ADHD. And then as you probably guessed, because there's a Venn diagram, there's both. I'm in there, in the fun part where I get everything, which sucks. But for inattention, these are the signs that you're going to see, the symptoms. People being easily distracted, missing details, forgetting things, swapping activities frequently, becoming bored with tasks after mere minutes, becoming easily confused, daydreaming, difficulty focusing on things they don't find enjoyable, problems directing their attention, difficulty processing information quickly. It's actually a really big problem. From the hyperactivity side of things, you're gonna see them fidgeting or squirming, 
You see people talking excessively in social situations, maybe where it's not appropriate, funerals. Trouble sitting still, constant motion, an inability to relax, short temper, sensation-seeking behavior, which is doing things like, say, paragliding in Mexico. Not that I've done that. Certainly not a dangerous activity you should do with an unlicensed Mexican in a speedboat. But the last part's impulsiveness which ties into that sensation-seeking behavior as well. But impatience, displaying emotion without restraint, difficulty waiting for things they want, often interrupting conversations, starting relationships, ending them on a whim, acting without regard for consequences. Do not use this list to diagnose people, by the way. These are just kind of representative. And I am not a licensed psychologist, so I can't tell you to diagnose people anyway. The Weird side effect of ADHD that I don't see a lot of people talk about is this kind of hyper-focus. You notice that I talked about inattention on things that weren't enjoyable. ADHD has this weird effect that when you do find something enjoyable, you can latch in on it and do that for hours. It's one of the reasons I like to code, or that I'm good at coding. This is a, it's not really a symptom, and people don't talk about it because it's positive, but it is one of the effects of it. So I've been looking for a long time for an example that I can show people visually kind of what it feels like to have ADHD because it's really hard to kind of internalize it. So this is probably the best thing I can come up with is if you do camera photography with a camera that's smart enough to have an f-stop, you can twiddle the f-stop, which changes the size of the aperture on the camera, which affects things like the focus. So if you have your f-stop and it is cranked up or crank down rather, fairly low, you can get a picture like this. You get a nice, clear representation of a twig. You can kind of see the twig up here. You're pretty sure those are trees in the background and a blue sky, but it's all very, very blurry. On the other hand, if you crank the f-stop all the way to 32 or plus, you get a picture like this. And this is a lot more like what your ADHD brain is like. This brain is doing the filtering for you. It's saying, this stick, that's important. That's what's important in this image. The ADHD brain does not do that for you. And instead, you get fun things like, well, there's a stick, but there's these other sticks. I can see this stick a lot better now, and there's this stick over here. I can see the sky through here, which I couldn't before, and I wonder what kind of trees those are, and I wonder why this tree is a bear of, a tree, or a bear of uh, leaves, and this tree isn't and those trees in the background, and I wonder if that's a fence or if it's a hedge or what's going on down there. That's kind of what's happening in the brain is you're just jumping from focus, from piece to piece in this image because nothing is being filtered for you. So physiologically, what's happening in my brain on a daily basis when this is happening? You've got that frontal cortex that I talked about. That's where those uh, in, er, executor functions are living. So current models of ADHD suggest that there are dopamine receptors that move from here, dopamine transmitters, excuse me, move from the limbic system up here. And in ADHD, they just don't do so good. We don't know why. We also know that there's more than to it than that. There are other pathways, other neurotransmitters that matter. But we know that this is the primary pathway. Let me describe this. Current models of ADHD suggest that it is associated with functional impairments in some of the brain's neurotransmitter systems, particularly those involving dopamine and nor norepinephrine. The dopamine norepinephrine pathways that originate in the ventral tegmental area there and locus coroleus project to diverse regions of the brain and govern a variety of cognitive processes. The dopamine pathways and norepinephrine pathways, which project to the prefrontal cortex and striatum, are directly responsible for modulating executive function, cognitive control of, control of behavior, motivation, reward perception, and motor function. These pathways are known to play a central role in the pathophys pathophysiology of ADHD, which is a lot of words for it don't work so good. There's just something where the transmitters don't flow, which is important. You need neurotransmitters because that's what actually transmits things from one synapse to the other. And if they're not there, or if there aren't enough of them there, the signals are altered on the way. So your intent, your desire can change from point A to point B. You can feel like you want to do a thing and you do something else entirely. And that's pretty much true of almost any mental disorder. 
So what actually causes this, right? We don't know. Why would we know? No, like a lot of mental disorders, we don't know. Actually, I don't think there's a single mental disorder we know what causes it, really. We might know the pathophysiology of it. We don't know what the actual cause of it is. We do know that genetics determine about 75% of cases. But we do know that other several disorders can cause similar symptoms. And that there are significant environmental factors that matter. Things like premature birth, low birth weight, early adversity, which is to say that you grew up in star you know, a starvation circumstance and you didn't get enough food early, brain damage. Other medical conditions can actually do mimic ADHD. For instance, lead toxicity can have a lot of similarities with hyperactivity or impulse control. Sleep apnea is a fun one. You could think you have ADHD and you could actually have sleep apnea. You're just not sleeping well enough. It takes about three nights of completely destroyed sleep before your brain starts displaying ADHD type symptoms. Hyperthyroidism is another interesting one that's fun to test for. If you're just getting, you know, your thyroid's out of control. Some people though, have a thing, they think about it in terms of social construction theory. This says that this was normal behavior at some point in the past. And that ADHD could have been considered normal behavior. But as society has progressed, Normal behavior has shrunk. We've normalized with each other. The world has become more global and we're sharing information and sharing behaviors with each other. So the norms are becoming smaller, the range of norms. And ADHD just kind of popped into existence as the normal behavior shrunk. That's some people's theory. Some people also think evolution is actually a cause. And I'm not a huge fan of Evo Psych, but some people believe that being distracted is actually way better for you in a survival environment. If I am busy with my sticks trying to make fire and a lion appears, I should switch focus to the lion because that's a fairly important thing that just occurred. If I'm sitting there constantly focusing on my sticks, that could be maladaptive in an evolutionary context. Some people actually think that there's a hunter versus farmer hypothesis. They believe that humans kind of come in two types. Some people are hunters where they focus, they need to change their focus rapidly, achieve a goal, move on to the next goal. And then there are farmers who methodically work through things. This was a pop psych book that came out in the 80s or the 90s. And it was a theory that people actually didn't believe in until actually some recent studies in epigenetics have started to support certain parts of that theory. Comorbidity is a fun term in psychology that means things that occur alongside it. It basically means that you can have other disorders which appear with it that may describe the same disorder, or it may mean you have two, or not. We don't know. We know that we have, you have more symptoms than a single thing will describe. So, things that commonly go along with ADHD, depression, anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder is another one. Social phobia is a huge one, often goes along with anxiety. And oppositional defiant disorder, and this is one you see a lot more in children than in adults with ADHD. Children just being defiant, being resistant to authority. So, how do you deal with this now that it's up in your brain, which is never going away? Stimulants, which a lot of people look at me and go, really? It turns out that to take somebody who is hyperactive and impulsive and has problems with attention and make them feel better reduce their symptoms, you just give them massive amounts of stimulants daily. I take am amphetamine every morning and sometimes in the afternoon, depending on the day. But let me tell you though, when you take it, it feels amazing. The first time I took Adderall, I was, on I was 15 when I took it initially, and I recently started taking it again within the past two years. The first time I took it in this most recent round, it was amazing. It was like a fog had been completely lifted from my brain. I was like, oh, oh, those were all the things I thought was so hard before that now I can just do. I can pay attention, I can actually get things done. So there are people who will tell you that the medicines don't work, which in some cases is true. 
There's people who will tell you that the efficacy drops after a certain period of time, and that is also unfortunately true. So sometimes you do have to crank the dose higher as you go. Uh, they do have side effects, high blood pressure. They're basically feeding you amphetamines every day. There are things that go along with that. But the improvement in life is drastic. Other things, therapy. And I consider this something that has to go along with the medicine, personally. Again, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, so. Um, meditation, and I meditate daily. Meditation is kind of like weightlifting for your focus, in a way, depending on which meditation you're doing. Other coping mechanisms, some good, some not so good. Uh, I had a couple coping mechanisms that I was using when I wasn't medicated, which ended up being maladaptive. Like I would make things feel higher stress than they were, so I would get them done. That didn't work so well when I was suddenly put into a high stress job. The stress is kind of compounded. And that's when I discovered I had anxiety syndrome. So. Other symptoms or coping mechanisms that do work rather are lists, timers, kind of like Pomodoro timers or other things, notes, copious notes, schedules, keeping track of your schedule pretty heavily, a fanatical attention to detail. And yes, that's intentional. You'll see people with ADHD do things that almost look like OCD behavior, and it's not. It's them making sure that the things in their environment are where they need them to be, and as they need them to be, to be effective. It's a coping mechanism. One of the things I didn't mention that I should have, um, if you see people mainlining like Red Bulls or Monsters, like it's, there's no tomorrow, they may be self-medicating for ADHD, which again, I'm not saying you should be diagnosing them, but it is a sign that you can look out for. Because there are a lot of people, me included, that you take the caffeine because it helps you focus. I mean, it is a stimulant, and large amounts of it help you focus just like the amphetamines do. I kind of described it as, um, if you take something and vibrate it fast enough, you can't tell that it's vibrating at all. That's pretty much what it feels like. It's just like kind of a rising up. So hopefully that was informational. Hopefully that was something to, uh, that gives you something to think about. I'm trying to, like I said, I want to do a couple more talks on other different behavioral disorders, mental disorders, that we can talk about why they exist, the people that have them, and hopefully break things open a little more. I know that we're trying to do the mental health first aid thing, um, which I need to remember to check in on that. I actually took the course myself, kind of audited it for everybody else here, and it was a really fun, not fun time, but it was an interesting experience for sure. Um, they focus a lot more on the critical aspects of things. Like it is the first aid, like, oh, this person is suicidal. What should you do? How do you know they're suicidal and what should you do? Less so than my coworker is has, you know, depression, clinical depression. How do I deal with that on a daily basis? Of course, doesn't really go into that, although I really wish they had a second course that did. But um, let's see. Is there any questions? In schools, you see teachers classifying kids as ADHD. Do you think that's fair or be an abuse term? That's a. I don't want to say it's a loaded question, but it kind of is. Um, it is true that there are children, parents and teachers who, ADHD, who overuse the term. There, it is also true that ADHD is a fairly common disorder, or relatively common disorder. And so in some cases, yeah, you can look at a child and it's very difficult to tell. Are they being hyperactive? Do they actually have ADHD? Or are they just a kid? Right? I mean, there's a very hard difference to tell here, there. And in some cases, I've seen parents who don't put their children on medication until they start showing signs of essentially like the, AD, the adult ADHD, like till they're 13, 14. Um, because it can be hard to tell. And then I've seen children that, yeah, you can tell. This children, this is not just something that is personality driven. This is you know, the child actually has a problem focusing, controlling their inhibitions. So it's, should the teachers be diagnosing it? Definitely not. Should a parent be diagnosing it? No. Should both of them be looking for signs so that they can ideally go, you know, do some testing with somebody who could diagnose it? 
Very definitely. So schools can suggest too, right? They can say you should have this child evaluated and they bring the psychologist into the classroom. Do they? Back in my end. Okay. I don't I didn't they've didn't do that in my day, but I went to a Montessori school for most of my education, which actually was a extreme boon to me because that was a very conducive environment for learning children with learning disorders. So um, any, any other questions? Thanks.